the topic which I shall like to discuss with you. Uh, you can see this is your course code. You don't have to memorize it. You don't have to remember it. Uh, but I would call it statistical analysis part one. So I would be having maybe three parts with you. So you would see two more sets of slides. And then one day I will take you to a computer lab and where we shall be practicing together on SPSS. All the techniques which you learn in, in two more sessions, well, I shall check with Salman how many more. Uh, all the techniques which you learn, you will be checking with the real data uh, in SPSS. But for that, I need to take you to a computer lab. So this is the quantitative analysis. Uh, this deals primarily with the data. The one reason why quantitative research is even more important uh, nowadays, uh, I think it's important to learn the research culture. Uh, the research culture, if I talk, there is one European culture and the second is American culture, right? Uh, but when I say Europe and America, uh, it doesn't mean that only in America or only in Europe geographically. No, it's a mindset. The European mindset has always been uh, pro-qualitative research. Whereas the American mindset has always been quantitative research, big data analysis. Even though if you see the recent past, uh, the recent history, uh, we talk a lot about big data and deeper and more sophisticated quantitative tools in Europe also. So there is a convergence of research culture. So the American culture, uh, just like any other aspect of culture, um, American culture is also invading so-called uh, in terms of research as well. So there is more and more convergence towards uh, quantitative research. And there's a reason for that. The reason is that we are living in the era where information is, has never been so important as it is now. So we are living in the age of information. And what is information? Information is data. What will you do if you have lots of information? Well, you will analyze it. Hence, you will analyze the data. So data analysis is not a elite product. It used to be the case when the data analysis was primarily uh, a, a kind of luxury of researchers. But nowadays, you see that in many corporates, there are people employed who are, well, they may be MBA in finance or whatever, but the reason they are employed is for deeper, in-depth, broader, quantitative research analysis. So there are statisticians or econometricians who are working even in the corporate sector. Some 20, 30 years ago, it was almost inconceivable that you are a PhD in econometrics. What are you doing in company? You should be in the university. You get my point? So the data analysis, because we are in the age of information and information without data um, is having an airplane with one wing. So you have to have, uh, you have to have this kind of two things in a, in a proper shape. Uh, normally the data uh, is used as a plural. There's always a confusion. Should we say this is data or this, this are, or these are data? You know, what do you think? Is data a singular or a plural? Uh, to me, data is always a plural. Uh, this, is a, this refers to the information that has been collected from an experiment, a survey, or an historical record. Uh, I'm sure Salman has discussed with you uh, about the primary and the secondary data. Yeah? The primary data and the secondary data. Yeah? Uh, for example, I wrote three examples here, experiment, survey, and an historical record. So you can see that experiment is a, 
primary data because you do by yourself. It's a first hand data generation. A survey is also a primary data, whereas historical record is a secondary data, right? Uh, I can give you the example of secondary data, uh, which I use. I, I primarily use uh, secondary data for my own research because my main research is about the company's performance here, yeah, right? And I have to look at their annual reports. Uh, I have to go to the Helsinki Stock Exchange data and download the information, okay? So I primarily deal with the secondary data. But of course, you can also do uh, quantitative research with the help of uh, primary data if you do some survey, right? For example, you do some, if, imagine, the thesis topic is in marketing, and you want to see uh, what age of consumers prefer social media more, right? Then you can ask people, and you can rank them on a scale of how often you use internet, how often you see advertisement on Facebook, right? So you can get the data over, all right, we surveyed 200 people in Uvascula, and 35 are in the age group of below 20, uh, 150 are in the age group of this and so on. So you start getting the data, right? Uh, this is the data which you generate through the survey, all right? Uh, you can do some experiment also. Experiment could be uh, that if I want to check the impact of the reason I'm saying all this thing is that everything I speak in the class, I would like to give you some example. And if I forget, please remind me. Uh, experiment we can do, uh, of course we can. Um, the one experiment could be, uh, does having a computer in front of you improves your learning? Right, make sense? So imagine, I divide you in two groups. And I ask a few questions about quantitative research at the end of the lesson to those people who have computer screen. And then I ask the same questions to the other people, uh, those who don't have access to computer right now. Of course, you have your mobile phone, but let's imagine this old fashioned traditional computer. Then, I would be getting two, this is an experiment, yeah? This is an experiment. Then I would be able to generate my hypothesis. What will the hypothesis? So imagine I do an experiment and I split the class in two parts, those who have computers and those who don't have. And then I ask you some questions and you respond. What exactly I'm trying to do in this case? Why I'm doing this experiment? Mm -hmm. Very good, very good. Hypothesis is a nice word. Hypothesis is a more scientific word Hypothesis is a more research, researchly accepted phrase. But if I don't use this big jargon, I can even have my assumption. Assumption is a milder expression than hypothesis. And even if I don't have an assumption, I can have my prejudice, my perception. Are you with me? My perception, my assumption, my, my bias could be that those people who have access to computer, they would be answering me better. I may be wrong with the help of when I do the data analysis, but this is my perception. We use a word in uh, statistic called My assumption or my bias or my perception is based on priority. Priority is 
before conducting experiment, what is in my head? What assumption is my head? This word come from prior. You know the prior? Prior to this, before. Something before. So when you do, you see what? When Einstein conducted the experiment that the apple would fall on earth, right? He must be having this assumption that apple will fall on earth. Hence, earth has a gravitational pull because Einstein was not the first person on this planet. The point I'm trying to make is that whenever you do some experiment, you have some bias perception in your head. When this bias, you start exploring. When this assumption, you start exploring with the help of lit literature, literature, then you start building up your arguments in support or against a notion. And at the end of the literature review chapter, you make a list of your hypotheses. So what separates a assumption and a hypothesis is that hypothesis is built up after doing extensive and intensive review of literature. So you get more scientific articles, you get the studies, experiments done by the predecessors of you, Whereas the assumptions or the perceptions or the, uh, or the biases are your own, right? And then your hypothesis would be, uh, does people who have access to computer overperform than the people who don't have access to it? So your main hypothesis in this case would be, does having a computer screen uh, have an impact on your performance, academic performance? This will be your main research question in this case. And your hypothesis will be those who have computers uh, overperform than those who don't have. This is the hypothesis. But hypotheses are of two types. The one is called one second, I will. This is called null hypothesis. Which is fit under fit one. Now I would like to tell again uh, what I wrote on the board is uh, two types of hypothesis. The one is null hypothesis, which is written as H uh, underscript zero. That's the way traditionally we write it. And the other one is called alternative hypothesis, which is H1, H underscript one. Hypothesis is a singular, but if you have more than one hypothesis, then we call them hypothesis. Okay. Uh, the null hypothesis, what, the reason I'm telling you these things right now, it, it's really important. Uh, you will relate it to them soonish, sooner, that the null hypothesis is based on the popular saying, a person is innocent until proved guilty. Have you heard this phrase? 
a person is innocent until proved guilty what does it mean remember i'm i'm trying to make it make a scene in front of you i the teacher the researcher makes an experiment you are my uh, 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 experiment uh, participants okay respondents and the survey i do is that those who have computer screen computer and those who don't have and i want to check does having or not having computer impact your academic performance that's my the main idea i want to test with you all right and my bias is that the reason i am interested in this research topic is that hey there are two groups of people in this class one who have continuously they're looking at the screen but they're also doing something on computer the other group of people the only thing they know is what i tell them so can it be so can it be so that those who have access to computer overperform academically over those who don't have but on the other side being a researcher one suggestion i would give you never look at the one side of the story because if you get too much obsessed with the one side then you are thinking subjectively but when you are seeing both sides of the story then that story becomes more objective remember this lady in the first row used what's your name nikolita she said that uh, quantitative research helps you to think more objectively when you see the overall picture the alternative views then your story becomes more objective so i want to ask you something and you please help me my assumption my perception is that those who have computer perform better can you say opposite to it can you find the opposite argument that those who have computer actually don't perform better or rather underperform than those who don't have computer yeah why why can look i i i said one side of the story maybe i didn't explain properly the one side of the story is that which is which could be my bias after all researchers are human beings they have their own biases yeah my bias is that those who have computers they have access to internet imagining and if i use some word here let's say i said that is data singular or plural mm -hmm. you can quickly check is data singular or plural but that time those who don't have they have no other choice to listen to me they will not check it before they go home you get my point so those people who have computer my assumption is that they would be in a better position to check my claims but now i'm asking you exactly opposite can you give me the argument can you give me some example where you think that those who have computers would rather perform badly and those who don't have will perform better can you give me some argument exactly they could be on facebook you get my point my assumption is that <laughs> this is something funny now my assumption my assumption is that those who use computer if i see them fiddling on the keyboard they would be checking is data singular or plural maybe they are using facebook and rather getting distracted i would say and how do i get the alternative arguments how do i know what who provides me this information I, i'm not a uh, nobody is nobody is a super brain that you can get all these opposite alternative multiple arguments these arguments we get from literature 
literature review enrich you with arguments ideas thoughts and polishing them and this is why this is why the hypotheses are always mentioned at the end of at the end of literature review chapter the second chapter is usually the review of literature all right you come with the ideas you see what is like um, how to say it it's like an input output as a researcher as a researcher you enter a research environment and then you exit from the community and we assume that you become better learner person after you come out in the machine when the output comes to the machine that would be better the input is you enter the machine with the raw idea or the ideas and you exit from the machine with better more polished more structured organized ideas and the name of this machine is called review of literature okay so the review of literature is like this um which is the most important chapter of your thesis my obvious answer would be review of literature that is the quality control between thesis the type of things you read the type of things you read the type of your findings will be so if you read high quality uh literature the quality of thesis will go up but if you read uh, some low quality things okay then it will go down so basically And when you come out, you come with better polished, structured, organized, less than anything thought or hypothesis. And then these hypotheses were tested by collecting the data, primary, secondary, and generalizing it. And in this part of the week, if your hypotheses are weak. then no matter how high quality data you get no it's not going to work all right so uh coming back to hypothesis your null hypothesis in this case which i this experiment thing would be remember uh, null hypothesis is always based on the assumption that a person is innocent until proved guilty so the null hypothesis would be that having a computer or not having a computer makes no difference our null hypothesis is always based on negation neutrality you know the neutrality neutral having a computer not having a computer is neutral right having the advertisement not having an advertisement makes no impact on sales because the person is innocent until proved guilty so the null hypothesis is always based on the assumption that there is not going to be any change on the contrary the alternative hypothesis is based on the assumption what you want to say it it's more impactful i want to test i want to test that computer having a computer helps you to perform better this would be the alternative hypothesis so i can say that my null hypothesis would be that having or not having computer makes no difference and my alternative hypothesis would be that having a computer makes you perform better mm -hmm. but didn't i say in one sentence that having a computer can be distracting 
So having a computer can both have can have both favorable and unfavorable effect. Mm -hmm. Right. So can I say so it affects you? Yeah. Having a computer affects you. So then my alternative hypothesis would be having a computer affects the reading. I'm not saying favorably or unfavorably. Because if I say favorable, then I'm on the one side. But on the other side, if I say having a computer unfavorably affects you, I'm on the other extreme. But it could be possible that some of you are genuinely using computer to study. And there are some people who are getting distracted by computer. But my, my argument is still valid that having a computer is affecting you, isn't? So in that case, I will not say favorable or unfavorable because if I say favorable, then I am on the one side. If I say unfavorable, I am on the other side. But if I say that having a computer impacts you, influence you, then this is a, this is what, this is a balanced hypothesis. So I'm on the both sides, okay? Uh, in some cases, we are able to find a balanced hypothesis, but in some cases we can't find it. Mm -hmm. Having a computer can have a bad impact and a good impact. Now, I want you to find an example where you think that the argument can be only on the one side, it's not possible to have the other side of the story. Like in this example, I could get two sides of the story. Computer affects you in a nice way, in a bad way. But your job now is to find some story or some experiment where you think that you can only see the one side of the story, the other side of the story is not possible. I have some arguments where I only see the one side of the story. Uh, imagine there's a company called GlaxoSmithKline. You know it? It's a global pharmaceutical company. And they are developing a new drug. They are developing a new drug. And the idea of this drug is that it will, it may cure some fatal disease, let's call AIDS. Now this company is spending a lot of money, millions, billions of dollars worth on R&D experimentation. The drug can be either successful, right? Or not successful. But it cannot be, it cannot lead to more AIDS patient's number. Are you getting a point? So the drug can either be successful, then it's on the favorable side, or it has no impact. So it's not successful. But you will never say that GlaxoSmithKline has invented a drug which leads to more AIDS disease cases. You with me? You can be successful, unsuccessful, or no, no, no. You can be successful, not non-successful, and unsuccessful. Can you see the difference? You are intelligent, not intelligent, or very poor academically. A success doesn't automatically mean failure. So when you develop a drug, let's say you start changing your learning style, that I want to change my learning style at home. It can be very successful. Number one, it can make no difference. Number three, it can even affect you unfavorably. Right? Did you get my example or not? That a company, GlaxoSmithKline, is developing a drug then your research question, your hypothesis would be that the drug, the, the alternative hypothesis would be that the drug 
have a good impact on the on the AIDS patients. You will never say that it will have the negative impact on the AIDS patients. Okay, so that is why in some cases we are. And for example, you can say that a company spending more on advertisement have a positive influence on its sales. So you are only testing, does advertisement have a favorable impact on sales? I think no company would ever test that when we advertise, it has negative impact, or can it? But it can actually. Sometimes you are thinking that this advertisement plan will have a negative impact on the sales. A Finnish company makes an advertisement and it becomes successful in Finland. But if the same Finnish company opens its operations in Malaysia or elsewhere, the same advertisement can have a negative impact because people over there, their social, cultural, economic background is different. They might respond differently. Sometimes people understand humor differently. So something uh, ad based on humor is very successful in Finland, but people don't even understand that humor elsewhere. Or people rather react negatively to that humor. Right? So yes, in, in the real life, you can find out some examples where, uh, and most of the examples you said are very, very right, very true. Okay? So, uh, statistics are normally descriptive and Inferential. Uh, why doesn't it? Yeah. Descriptive. Descriptive uh, statistics are used to summarize and describe data. I'm reading it out. Example A city has issued 200 birth certificates in a month to the first time mothers. All right. There are 200 first time moms in the city who have been issued uh, the birth certificate of their child. And you can see that the table is here. There are under 20. These are the age groups of first time mom. All right. And you see the number. Now see what? This data is summarized. So imagine there are information of 200. So imagine, so all the table, there are 200 human beings who I summarized in how many rows? One, two, three, four. In five rows, I could summarize those 200 women. Data, the descriptive statistics help you to summarize the data. The tabular form, the graphical form, they are good ways to summarize the data. Then I say, the average age is not shown here, but I calculated it in Excel yesterday. And I found out that the average age of a woman who become mom first time is 28 and a quarter of a year. This represents the whole 200 women. This is a representation of 200 ladies who became mom first time. It means what? This describes, this describes the, the, that description is a representation. It represents that in this city, uh, the women who became first time mom, they are, most of them, or the majority of them are, uh, if you have to find one representative sitting in those uh, group of 200 people, then that woman who is 28 and a quarter, would be the most representative woman in, the, in that sample. So descriptive statistics are, uh, they describe and they summarize the data. The previous examples we had, it can be compared over time and space. We make comparisons over time and space. Over time, let me, let me focus on this word over time. If I have, I, if I'm in the same city where this data come from, 
same city. These statistics belong to one month. And I took, let's say this month is uh, November, uh, uh, September, yeah? Then I see how many first time mom uh, in January, first time in February, March, April, all the months. So in the same city, I'm comparing how many women become mom first time in different months. And then I find out, is there any correlation? Which month, which month uh, we have the moms, uh, who are the, uh, the, the women who become mom first time, right? So what I'm doing here, I'm comparing statistics over time, over time. But the space is same. Space is what? The city, where this data comes from. But in the second example, we can also compare them over space. Let's say I take the data of different cities of the women who become first time mom in five different cities of Finland. So September, Uvaskula, September, Turku, September, uh, Kopio, September, Vasa, and then I compare them. Now what I'm doing here, I'm comparing over space. I can compare them time and space both. So I have last six months data for Uvascula, six months data from uh, Tampere and so on and so forth. So I can do both time and space comparison. But remember one thing, here I'm a bit sarcastic. I say descriptive statistics are just descriptive. It means what? Descriptive statistics are like introductory data analysis. Like, like you just enter, you just enter the analysis phase. But it's a very preliminary analysis. It's very hard to draw conclusions and generalization based on descriptive statistics. You can compare data over time and space, but you can't really establish uh, the dynamics. For example, I write here, uh, this question I can never answer with descriptive statistics. And the question is that, does socioeconomic status influence the birth of child? I can only compare in the month of September, there are more moms uh, in Uvascula than in Tampere. But what does it tell? Does it tell that the women in Ampere and in Uvascula have different socioeconomic background? It doesn't show me anything. So it's a very preliminary, uh, like, a, uh, like a preliminary handshake when you, when you meet somebody, right? So it's like, just like a matchmaking thing, but you can never know the deep into the system that what exactly are the dynamics, which factors, why the average age of a woman uh, when it gives birth to first child in Tampere is more than that of in Uvascula? What factors contribute it? It doesn't tell. For this, we need to study the inferential statistical analysis, which I would take you through not long time to go. Okay? Uh, any questions so far? The word is descriptive. It, it describes. It doesn't go, it doesn't analyze too deep. That's the that's very important thing. Uh, some of the uh, descriptive statistics I share with you. The first one is measures of central tendency. Basically, it is all about the averages. We want to find some representative value. We want to find some average value, which is representing the entire sample, okay? Uh, frequently, normally, we use three measures of central tendency. The first one is called mode. Mode is the number which comes most frequently. You know, frequently, the number which comes most frequently. For example, I make an experiment here in this class uh, of 12 students. 
12 okay and and most of you are getting eight marks yeah so most of you are getting eight marks and eight would be the modal score the mode score the most frequently observed number is called mode are you with me the second and this is how the mode looks like so there's a data and this shows how many times it occurs and see what this is a peak yeah and look at that frequency for example this number comes only five three times i think this number comes only four times but this number comes around seven times and there's no other number which comes seven times can you see here if i draw a line fictitious almost uh parallel on y axis this touches seven yeah nearly seven so seven is the highest time a number has occurred and that number would be 30 40 uh, let's say it's 35 or 36 i don't know I, I didn't write it but anyways this number 36 is the mode value why because it comes the most frequent times this is called the modal number but i will show you with the help of experience right now okay uh, the second number comes the second uh, average uh, is called the median the median is the average which divides the total data in two equal parts mm -hmm. so that number which come exactly in the middle 50 percent so the, that number which divides the data 50 percent this side 50 percent this side not by the value but by the location okay and the mean is the one which adds up the numbers and we divide by the, num the number of numbers and then we find the one average that is called mean mean not only consider well the mean only consider the location uh, sorry i said opposite the median consider the location not the value mean considers the value not the location are you with me okay so the mode is one which comes most frequently the mean is the one which takes into account the total value of the numbers and then we divide them and we find one average number uh, by the way mean median mode they all are averages but as a popular perception if if you call somebody uh, what is the average they would say it's a mean 90 percent people would say mean but mean is a one average so is median and so is mode mm -hmm. make sense uh before i go further i want to make i want to clear a doubt between mean and median i said median is the one which consider location than the value and mean is the one which considers the value than location now i have to give you proof for this to give you a proof i need to draw some numbers all right so if i show you this let me see if this is uh, visible uh, let me check first of all oh sorry yes it's fine it's okay uh, Oh, uh, it was already getting recorded. All right. So you can see here that we have marks of 11 students. This is mean. This is uh, median. And this is mode, yeah? And you can see here that your mean is this. See what? Uh, I was telling you that mean, median, and mode are called averages. All are averages, right? But if I start looking for in Excel, even this says average. So even Excel is not aware that mean, median, and mode, they all are averages. So ideally, it should have been 
is equal to mean but it says average anyways that's from my point but the way you calculate is you put the you select the data uh, after average and then select the data and that's the mean and look here you can use excel to find so just find median and select the data and then mode is also very simple just write mode and select the data so you can do it in excel excel is a uh, is a very useful tool sometimes i prefer excel over spss also but of course we will do with the help of spss okay uh, and now what happens when i change this data from 8 to 48 and you can see that only mean is affected so this is the beauty of the median and mode that they are more consistent more reliable but but in the empirical research we use mean more frequently than median and mode in very rare cases we use median and mode uh, i did some research a couple of years ago and those articles are available in optima i used median because there was no choice I had to use median, but normally, normally in the empirical research, we use uh, mean most frequently, but we have to live with the limitation that mean is less consistent than median and mode. All right, makes, makes difference, make, make some ideas, okay? The only reason we use mean is that it's more fashionable and it's easy to calculate, that's the only thing convenience and it's more widely accepted in the empirical research but i wanted to show you that this is not a very consistent if i make it even more extreme 248 6 look 27 27 doesn't represent anything there's no number 6 you can see in the given distribution 7 you can see in the given distribution but 27 belongs to none here there's no one close to 27 so this is a problem with the mean we must be aware of. All right. Um, and this is the way we calculate uh, X bar. Yes, sir. Uh, actually, I'm thinking that I would give you I have to remind myself. The next measure is called skewness. Skewness. Uh, the skewness is about the symmetry of the data. Is data symmetrically distributed? Uh, for instance, I'm, I'm taking a pause here, but I will come back to it. The skewness shows the symmetry of the data. Uh, if the data is normally uh, is, is like a bell shape curve that all the points on the right side are same same having same height on the left side then the data is very nice clean symmetric but often the data could be skewed and you can see here the data is skewed on the right side more can you see most of the data is on is resting on the right tail of the distribution curve. This is called uh, positive skewness. Why positive? Because it is on the right side. And if you look at the origin, if you see the X bar line there, X bar is in the middle. On the right side, numbers are more than average. Hence, the difference is positive. On the left side, the numbers are below average. It means the difference between the number and the mean is negative. So we call the left side uh, as a negative, negatively skewed distribution, and the right side as a positively skewed distribution. For instance, you can see um, here. Oh, yeah. So if I have to draw uh, the curve, which is a positive, negatively skewed, then most of these numbers. Uh, will be on the left side like like for example the second the bottom right line Can you see the bottom right line over there? So that is a that is a negatively skewed 
because most of the line, most of the points, they are on the left side of the mean value. All right. And one more characteristic. So have you got the idea? Uh, in SPSS, you can be, you are in a position to draw the data, which I shall show you next week. Uh, I, I want to keep a little bit. Yeah. So this is the right or the positively skewed. And the one characteristic of positively skewed uh, distribution is that mode is smaller than median and median is smaller than mean. So if a distribution is normally distributed, then mean, median, and mode would be what? Mean, median, mode would be same. So one important characteristic of normally distributed curve is that the mean, median, and mode are same. However, if the curve is uh, not symmetric, all right? Uh, like, let's say it's like this, positively skewed, then mode is lesser than median and median is lesser than mean. In fact, I have uploaded uh, why can't I? Oh yeah, sorry. If you go to Optima and you go to the data sets, uh, there is a research methods data. So I would be using this data for my experimentation in the class. And you will find that. Uh, let me make it bigger. So these are the houses, yeah? Yeah. So there are houses here. And if I want to find the mean of this data, mean, median, and mode, uh, what was the function of mean? Can somebody tell me? Average, which is wrong, which is conceptually wrong. Because median is also an average. So I think Excel, uh, should know that they should call it mean, not, not average. So average, can you see average here? So if I select the data, so that's a mean. Mm -hmm. Let's say these are the houses prices. They are, they are the housing prices data, let's say, yeah. So it means that um, if this, the, these numbers are in million, Im imagine, yeah, if the data is in million, um, million dollars. It means the average, the mean housing price uh, is 56 million dollars. That's very expensive. But let's assume that we are very rich. And then median, median here. Can you see here, mean, median, mode. Median means if you make a series of houses prices by their value from the lowest value to the highest value, the house which comes in the middle from the lowest value to the highest value is worth 33 million. Mm -hmm. And the most of the house's value which is close to is close to 12 million, uh, comes more often. And if you take the value of the houses in the weight, the value, then the average is 
56 million. And if you see, if you compare this with this, the data whose mode is less than median and whose median is less than mean is having positive skewness. And I guess in this example, your mode is the smallest, then comes median and then comes mean. It means that if I want to plot this data, uh, then what should be, how should it look like? Positively skewed? Yeah? So it should be positively skewed. And what I do here, before I let you go home, is that I go to SPSS. So to, I was thinking for the next week, but I want to take you to the SPSS thingy. Uh, all the computers in the university have SPSS. But what I ask you, next time bring your computer, if not everybody, then you should be able to share it with us. And if you go to these people in the help desk, in the IT help desk, you know, they can actually uh, help you to, to install SPSS in your computer. I think you can even access SPSS differently, even from home. But I think they would be in a better position. Please let me know in the next two days, are you able to have SPSS on your computers? You have it, wonderful. But if you don't have, then please remind me. And if they are able to, if they are not able to help you, then I have to change the venue of our meeting to a computer lab. Even though, even we get one hour, it will be enough. But next week, I want that all of you should have access to SPSS on your computers, or you are able to share, or we have to move somewhere. But first, ask this IT help guy. They will, I know, I know that you will be not the first people to ask them. I know in the past, uh, people do go to them and they can help you to have access to SPSS on your personal computers, not the university computers. But, anyways, uh, I'm still waiting. It takes time. SPSS before it shows up. SPSS can be very moody, very temperamental. I can. So now we are in the now we are in the op, uh, uh, SPSS space, and you can see the variables I pasted, uh, copied and pasted from spreadsheet. Housing prices I got from here. This L column, and you can see that we are in the data view. But if you go to the variable view, I change the name of the variable house price, and you can select number of decimals you want to choose. If the number is very small, let's say 0 0.0003. If you don't increase the decimals, they all will show zeros. So you have to be very careful about it, the selection of decimals. Anyways, so what I do here, be careful, listen to me. Go to analyze. In the analyze function, you can see the descriptive statistics. Do you know, have you heard this phrase called descriptive statistics before? Have you heard this or not? You haven't heard it. Are you sure you haven't heard it? I'm asking today, have you heard it? I didn't say that you have, have you heard it last year? <laughs> have you heard it or not? You have heard it. So descriptive statistics, go to frequencies. It's very simple. I repeat. Analyze is the most important function of SPSS. Descriptive statistics, that's what we are doing. We go to frequencies, right? And you can see that at this moment, you know, uh, this is a football pitch. This is the football ground, and this is a dugout. Dugout means where the players are sitting. The player is house price, it's not clean. We want this player to play means we want to perform analysis. So what I do here, I select and enter. So see what? The player has moved from dugout to the pitch. And if I want to send this player back to the dugout, I can send it. 
but the player will do nothing unless the player is in the pitch. So it has to be here. All right, and then what we do, statistics. Mean, median, mode, that's what we want. But I also want not the values, but the graph, because that is why I choose to SPSS, isn't it? So what I do here, I, I continue, and then I see charts here, charts, and I click histogram, histogram, and continue. You know the histogram? The lines and the graphs, and then again continue, and then OK. Now, there's a magic wand going on. Is it even working? Oh, yes, it's working. So you can see. Mode is the smallest, median and mean, so there's no difference between Excel calculations and the SPSS calculation. But the, the point I want to make is something else. Processing. Does it look something similar to this? Does it look something similar to this line? Does it? The height is different, of course, the data is different, yeah? But can you see the trend that most of the weight is on the right side? Something like this. Hence, you can say that, hence, you can say that your data is skewed positively. But if there, if there, if there, was, a, there was a reverse, if this peak was here, and most of the line was on this side, most of the data was on the left side, then you would call it negatively skewed data. Okay, so you can see the skewness. So you not only have seen the skewness, that how it looks like, but you also have checked the law. The law says that if the series, the data is positively skewed, then mode is smallest, median is smaller, and mean is the highest, all right? And we not only saw that, but we also saw that something extra that, yes, the line would look like positive. Most of the information, if the average is here, then most of the data is on the right side. So it's positively skewed uh, thing. So the data is not normally distributed, okay? So the experiment, actually, what if the data, just for the sake of experimentation, if the data is, uh, one, two, three, four, if it is one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, what is the average of one, two, three, four, five? One, three, six, no, one, two, three, four, five. If the data is one, two, three, four, five, three? Please calculate somebody. Just write one, two, three, four, five. And then I pause and re record. So you can see here that when I take the data one, two, three, four, five. Now, what can be more consistent data than one, two, three, four, five? And when you have such a consistent data, you find that your distribution curve looks so normally distributed, completely right tailed. So you can see that if this is the average three, yeah? So one point on the right side is same length, the one point to the left side. Two points on the right side have same length as two points on the left side. So very well equally balanced. But when you see the previous data, which was of the housing prices, and you can see that it's not so well uh, distributed data, positively skewed. Hmm? Make sense? So now I take a